you go. All right. Um, first of all, I have a pretty bad headache right now, so I hope I'm not going to bore you too much. But I'll try. Uh, well, try to stay on top of things. So, um, what I want to do in this session today is basically show you a little bit of the code and answer any questions that you may have. Um, has any one of you guys looked at the code? All right, so I think um, maybe it's good if we start from the high level again, start from this graph and then uh, talk a little bit about it or just recap this. Maybe you've forgotten it from yesterday. And uh, oh man, these arrows are beautiful. And then um, and then get the code. So let me start with our web page. I'm sure you've seen that one. And uh, there are all the links that you need on here, um, specifically how you can clone the Git repository. Are you all familiar with Git? Okay, so that's not going to be a problem. That's great. Then uh, I, I assume you have the code, or uh, you can get it with this command. And we'll look at it later. Um, I can talk again about this and then uh, walk through the code and look at it. So one of the, well, the core, the, the main component of NetConf at the moment is a reactor loop. And this reactor loop is basically se centered around a select call. Um, there is a little bit that we have to do in addition to select because we have timeouts and we have signals and all that kind of stuff and Python doesn't make it very easy. So we'll see that later on. But basically the core um, has a select loop with file descriptors. So whenever there is a file descriptor that has data on it to read, right now it's only reading. I initially thought we might have to do writing at one point in time, but um, it's only reading, so whenever you, in the code you, you will often see FD reactor, and they are actually called FDR reactors, so file descriptor read reactors. Um, we might change that at a later point in time uh, because I don't think we need any of the other select uh, possibilities, like can we actually write to a file descriptor? Can we actually, um, is there an error on the file descriptor? Because so far all the file descriptor stuff has been very unproblematic. Um, so I didn't see any need to, to do anything there. So in this loop, you have a couple of reactors. And uh, that's basically sort of the core um, approach to putting any, anything into it, registering anything with NetConf. Like for instance, the control socket, which is what I used yesterday in the demo, um, where you issue the commands and let NetConf do something. But uh, also dhclient and then also WPA supplicant and so on, which has a control socket, socket. So everything goes over file descriptors, and we're actually using a lot of file descriptors, which may or may not be a problem. I don't think it's going to be a problem at all. I mean, uh, I don't actually know what the maximum number of file descriptors that a process can open is, but I would assume it's somewhere around 64,000, so, uh, or 65. But uh, I don't think we're going to reach that. I hope not. I don't see us doing that. So. Uh, what happens basically if you have uh, the control socket and you want to issue a command on the control socket is that there will be data on the file descriptor that is associated with the socket, the listening socket, and the reactor for this will then actually s create another reactor that will handle the client. So this is basically the multi, uh, um, I forgot the, what the term for that is, but it's basically like SOC stream. Um, which allows you to do multiple clients on a single socket. So it's not a one-to-one -one, uh, thing, but for every single client that connects, we spawn a reactor of its own. And that reactor then actually does the event um, creation and passing. So the reactor creates an event. It goes through the authorizer. Um, the authorizer's job is basically just to, to figure out whether this should be able, this should be possible to do there are going to be other event sources here. Um, for one of them that I didn't include here, for instance, is Netlink, which is basically listening to kernel events so that if you plug in or have a new network interface or if there is a link status change on the network interface, then and there's also an event created here. So they also go through the authorizer, and the authorizer uses the, 
the data from the request as well as the source where it comes from to authorize the request. So because Netlink doesn't have UIDs, it's always the kernel that does it, um, the authorizer will actually not look at UIDs at all when it comes from the Netlink socket. This is actually implemented such that the authorizer asks, again, the control socket. Um, I'll show you this in the code later. So then we come to the interface policy. Um, and at the interface policy, we have, we have two events, basically. So it's an event-based system. Um, and there are two classes of events that exist. One of them is the command event, and the other one is the result event. Now, um, we've only recently added all this event stuff, or re-added it um, until January. NetConf was multi-threaded and had events, and everything was going via events. And then I decided to kick out the multi-threading, and it was just single-threaded from that point on. And uh, for some reason, which I can't really explain, um, I also got rid of the events. Um, I honestly don't know why I did that, because events seem to be the a very good approach to, to taking this sort of like asynchronous um, approach. A question? Why, why did I want to go uh, to single thread? Um, that there is, uh, in, the, in the archive, if you're actually, if you're very interested in the technical reasons, I'm not going to be able to discuss all of them, but um, so if you look in, into the archive, I think in ref, there is an IRC log um, in January 16th and then also on January 22nd um, about, this was in Debian Devel, about all the things that threads do and are bad and so on and so forth. Um, the, the main reason that made me think about it first is no polling. So the initial implementation that I had was basically a multi-threaded um, event passing structure and the, each event had um, an event lock like a mutex basically and in order you would basically wait for the event you would issue the event and you would wait for the event to be completed in some other thread and this waiting is polling and polling wakes up the processor all the time and so um, if you run power top and you had the netconf running at the same time it was going at 99.8 percent or something like that so it was very very bad I mean, that's not that's not how you write code. Um, there was there were two solutions out of that. One of them um, is to say I'm going to not use polling, but I'm going to use a select based um, approach where I have a pipe between. Well, basically the marking an event done is done via a pipe that is created for each event, and then we use select to block on that pipe. And when the event is done, you write some data to the pipe, and then the select returns. And it's basically the same thing without polling. Um, that was one possibility, and you know that, that would have also consumed a lot of file descriptors. It's always two for, for each pipe. Um, but at that point in time, I also didn't like the multi-threaded approach at all. It was horrible to debug. It was very, very difficult, um, especially, I mean, as soon as you're in a debugger, you're stepping through code, and, and it's not real time anymore. It's absolutely non-deterministic. So I, f I found it really hard to figure out what's going on at what point in time. And I guess that's a problem that everyone has when you do multi-threaded development. So then I decided, like, let's just go completely single-threaded. And um, it seems to me that this is a sort of like um, common thing to do. Um, when you have, like, first of all, Twisted was named yesterday, so I looked at Twisted today, which is a, a framework, a reactor framework for Python that allows you to uh, write servers very easily and clients for the internet, and uh, they are also single-threaded. Well, they, their main loop is single-threaded. They have an API for the main loop so that you can swap in any other one, uh, GTK and so on and so forth, but um, their default approach is a single-threaded approach. and. Uh, I also looked at implementations like Apache, for instance, where you actually have a model that has multiple threads, but each one of these threads is in and of itself single-threaded. So the, it's simply an optimization, actually, of the single-threaded model, so that you just simply have five that can react much faster, um, five threads, but each of them is actually single-threaded. So uh, it's, not, it's not that Apache just creates a lot of threads all over the place. I think this is a, the, the preferred approach. Now, 
this actually caused us a lot of problems because if you, um, if I just, uh, is there a pen for this? Do we have one? Well, I, I can use I can use the, the text editor here quickly. Um, like if you I imagine you have this function, right? And the function, oh yeah, it's Python. There's no braces. Um, the function basically does something, and then it says event wait, right? And then it, it would continue to do something else. Um, so this was what what was in use in the beginning when it was multi-threaded and it was very simple because you had a function and you could wait and then you could continue with the function. Every single variable that you declared up here was available down here, right? So very, very simple. Um, now, as soon as you go to single-threaded, you don't have this anymore because none of the languages that I know um, make it easy to write something like coroutines. So you have no possibility to jump into the execution of a function from the outside. You can't say, look, I'm going to stop executing here, and then when you're done, I want you to continue executing right there where you were um, with all the context and all the, the state information. So if you, if you wanted to do it with a single-threaded approach, then you would have your function, and it would basically do something like... Um, it would issue an event, um, whatever, if up, and that would be it. The function would be done, right? Now, in order to be able to react to this, like in order to be able to say, look, I have to actually do something once this event has been processed, I have to know that the event has been processed, you have to start using a callback. So we call these things CB, uh, for instance, result. Um, and then CB result is just another function where you then do your stuff. But because you don't actually have X, so if you say Y equals X here, that's going to be a syntax error. There is no X, right? So in order to do that, now you suddenly have to have arguments here. So uh, now you want X to be passed here, but how are you going to do this? So um, because you can't really be, pa you have to pass a function pointer, and the function pointer can't take any arguments. So uh, then we started to do stuff like this. You, you, you used Python, which was uh, Python closure. Um, um, handle result or something like that, and handle result would simply uh, do y. Um, how did it work? Um, it would call CB result, that's it, with X, because X is actually in the scope here, right? And so now instead of CB result, we did handle result. And now this would work, because now CB result was being called with an X. I could be passing around arguments. Um, so y this is actually very Pythonic. Uh, you can't really port this into C or C++. However, um, what you can port it. Um, first of all, C uh, new, newer standards allow you to do this kind of stuff. And then on the other hand, any t single time you're using a closure function like this, you can also create a class that is callable and store the data in there. So it's, it's, it is portable. Um, and we should have, in very many cases, it would have been a lot better if we had done uh, a class, if we had used a class um, for this approach, simply because it's cleaner. Um, Twisted, which uh, I looked at today and so James also looking at it. Um, does it like that? It uses a class that is called a deferred, and the deferred basically manages your callbacks. So whenever this function is is done, it would actually return a deferred object, and that deferred object would then could then be used to register callbacks with it. And you would still have the callback situation though. But I think it does all the argument passing for you. So that was very simple. But if you if you look at if you compare this function up here, which is very simple and it's very linear, to this, you can see that stuff gets pretty complicated very quickly. Uh, so by changing from multi-threaded to single-threaded, we had we had to completely rethink the way that the main loop works, the way that we do stuff in the in the um, process, and it gets 
it gets horribly disgusting um, if I show you the ETC network interface handler later, um, which actually uses a work queue to, to you know, be, do what, what multi-threaded stuff does for you. So I'm, I'm in very many ways emulating or simulating uh, multi-threaded programming in a single-threaded uh, design. So that, that, you know, it's a, it had many repercussions, this decision, but I still maintain that it's a good approach. And if I look at Twisted and if I look at Apache, then it seems to confer, uh, confirm that this is actually the way to go. So where were we? Um, we have these events, and we have the interface policy. And the interface policy, we'd like to think about it as just a giant case statement that looks at command, um, its arguments, the source, where it's coming from, any previously uh, used handlers on this command, and their results. So initially, any event would be just the command, its arguments, the source, and then none and none, because nothing has been tried and nothing has been returned. So that's sort of the initial handler that you get in return. Um, once we tried to do ETH0 IF up on the control socket and ENI was returned and that failed, then the interface policy would now make or issue the question like, look, I want IF up on ETH0 to happen. It's coming from the control socket. And we actually previously tried ENI, which said it failed. What should we do now? And then it returns the HCP. I'll get into the code in, in just a second. Um, the way we ended up realizing this is by saying that we have event, an event hierarchy. So a command event is a parent. And then every other event that is related, that is issued because the command event came around, has a parent pointer to the previous event. So it's, it's actually, um, rather than being a, a sort of a, um, shallow tree, every single event has one and the same parent pointer to the command event, we actually have events pointing to the previous event. So if DHCP also fails and we do link local, then the link local result event will be, have a pointer to the event that, um, to the result event from DHCP, which was a failure, which was, will have a pointer to the result event from ENI, which was a failure, which will have a pointer to the initial command I've up. And by going up and down that um, tree, the ancestry, we can figure out exactly what was being tried. And we also have uh, all the information available in passing around the commands. So I think that's, that's sort of the core. Um, I will spare you DH client. I will not even talk about the implementation of DHCP handler. Um, I'll, I'll show you the code briefly. And then I guess we should also look at this FD proxy stuff. And let me pull up the code, but let me uh, say before I do so that, um, first of all, the last three hours I had network problems, so I couldn't pull the changes that my student made. I just managed to pull the changes that he made, so I haven't looked at them yet, so I might be a little surprised here and there when the code comes up. Um, al although we've been talking about it, what he was doing, and it's probably correct. The other thing, though, is that a lot of the, um, a lot of the code is very hackish at the moment. Um, there are still functions in the code that aren't being used anymore. We just haven't deleted them. Um, there are also certain um, constructs that are absolutely horrid in there. Um, the, way, the, the reason why we did that is because we said that at this point in time, we are unable to actually make informed design decisions because we don't know what the requirements are in, in like small cases, right? So we would say, look, let's just do it this way. Let's just do it the quick and dirty way and see if this gets us anywhere, and then if it does, we can actually reconceptualize. So um, this, is, this is pretty much the point where we are at. There are a few of those cases, and because of these, these cases exist, we both refused to, well, I don't actually know if my student refused. I think he would have liked to have NetConf 1.0 out for the talk yesterday as well, a lot. Um, but I, I was the one that decided that we're not gonna do it because it's, it would have just, it would have scared people off, I'm pretty sure. So um, I hope it doesn't scare you off. Let's have a look. Um, so there, there's actually like daemon.py. You don't have to care about that. Um, it just basically makes sure that it does all the setup and does all the argument parsing. And it, 
it detaches you from the PTY and kills your, uh, makes, puts you in it, your own process group and so on and so forth. So that's pretty boring. Um, the daemon actually instantiates a core object and then calls that core object and specifically calls the function run on it. So this is how the program starts, right? Um, there is actually a flag for is running. We need that for the signal processing so we can take it down easily. And then you can see here that we do signal listening stuff. Um, signal listening involves us to actually have a pipe that listens to signals. So what, what's happening here is that we're basically we're registering a signal listening pipe and we are registering a dictionary that says that if, if we receive sigint on that pipe, then call self.quit. Um, and the signal handler is the same for all of them. So whenever we call something like this, then sigint is added to the list of signals that are being handled by sig handler. And sig handler will simply just write, currently it's the string representation of the signal to the pipe, followed by two new lines. Uh, obviously, this is brittle as hell. Like, uh, there's no guarantee that this will actually arrive um, on the other end of the pipe by the time that you read it or by the time that you return to the select loop, the single threaded approach makes that a lot easier. It do actually makes it very, very likely that you get it. Um, but if, if we were to implement this in, in C or C++, or as soon as we will, then uh, th this has to be done differently. And one of the easy ways, of course, is to just simply write one byte right, with the signal. But you know, the Python kind of makes you want to be explicit. Uh, and it, th it works in Python at all times, because uh, this stuff is being handled properly by Python so that you don't actually have to worry about it at all. And on the other hand, you don't, um, th um, all of the reactors that are shaving the data of the file descriptors are engineered in such a way that they um, can be called multiple times. So if the request that you got or if the data that you got on the reactor is incomplete, it'll just be buffered. And then it, the reactor is expected to be called again because there will be more data available on the file descriptor, and then it appends to the buffer, and then it fires off the request. So it's kind of, it kind of, uh, it works, at least in Python. So then we create another, uh, the control socket listener here, and you can see here the register FDR reactor, the file descriptor read reactor. Basically, soc FD being the file descriptor integer, and then here is the reactor, the callable that is getting called, which is then responsible for taking the data off the file descriptor. And we start the main loop. And now the main loop has, sorry, looks rather awful at the moment, but a lot of it is uh, debugging information, and uh, except for this stuff, which says here temporary. So there's this weird bug that I totally can't figure out, where uh, at some point in time, there is um, a file descriptor integer left in the list of file descriptors to check, even though I removed it previously because the EOF had been received. I have no idea. But Python is lovely, you know, like it, it, can, it, it allows me to like fire up a debugger when this happens. Um, and then I can, I can go ahead and inspect stuff. So uh, this is definitely temporary. And if you factor out from, from here down to there, if you just forget about that, then I, uh, and then you f take out all the debugging information, then it actually looks OK again, right? So there, there are two things we're doing here, because there are usually three things any program has to worry about. One of them is file descriptors, then signals, and then uh, you want to do something that is not event-based, like timed callbacks is what we call them. Um, so since the signals are handled by file descriptors now, um, that's all, the only two things we have to worry about, file descriptors and timed callbacks. Timed callbacks is very simple. You just register a, f a function that is called so together with a timestamp, and then you can see up here, uh, basically this is the calculation. If that timestamp is reached, the list is sorted. So we insert, we bisect insert every single time. So the list always has the next timed callback up front. And then we just simply look. If there are any timed callbacks, um, if the one has to be fired now, <coughs> and if it does, then we do. We, we set a timeout, which could potentially be you know, like 15 seconds in the future so that the select loop then returns, because as soon as we actually block in the select loop, there's nothing we can do. So if there is a timed callback, we set the timeout so that further down here, with the select loop will then actually return, even though no data has been received on any of the file descriptors. Um, so the timeout is being assembled up here, and this is the select loop. This is the 
the important call. This is where everything blocks. This is where the program spends most of the time. And we're passing it simply the, um, all of the file descriptors that have been registered as reactors and get it back a list. And, well, I explained the timeout. So this will block. And we only get here if there is data on any of the file descriptors or there is a timeout. And then debugging info, and we simply say, look, invoke all the file descriptors, shave up all the data, or call all the reactors, actually. Um, this function is very, very simple. I'll show it to you in a second. And then when that, when that returns, then we do all the timed callbacks. And then we need this because Python is weird at times. So let's have a look at that. Um, very, very simple. This is a dictionary indexed by file descriptor. It gives you a callable. You call the callable. This time um, we're passing in read. Up is the operation read, write, or error, which we get back from select. We only need read, the file descriptor. And we're also passing in the core object uh, because we need that to later unregister the, file, the, the reactor again and, and if we want to add time callbacks. So we, we kind of be, we're passing around the core object a lot, which I don't like very much. but. The, uh, the alternative seems to be a global object, and I don't like that either. Um, this is where the test-driven development comes in, it makes things very, very interesting, because uh, you have a dependency of almost every single item that we test. It has a dependency on core, so we kind of have to mock that up all the time, which makes it, I like mock objects by now. Um, my student has convinced me of them. They're pretty good, but uh, it, it adds complexity, and I wish there was a better way to do it, but I don't think there is. All right, so let's have a look at one of the reactors. Um, and I, I guess I'll start with the control socket. Are there any questions so far? So this is specifically very hackish at the moment, simply because we haven't exactly figured out what events we need. We, I call it a language of events. Um, there's still stuff that we have to work on. Um, and then we probably want to use something like an event hierarchy where you can say um, there is an event class and then there is a command event subclass and the result event subclass. And for instance, a success result such as DHCP bound is a child of a success result, is a child of a result event, is a child of an event. So that at any point in time you can actually like decide whether you want all of the events or only successful result events and so on and so forth. So basically polymorphism um, or with C++ we'd be using something like uh, um, over overloading. Sorry? Virtual. Sorry? Virtual. Virtual. Um, yeah, it, it is. That's polymorphism. So yeah, definitely. Um, I think we would have to re do it with overloading, but that's also polymorphism. They're all related. So virtuals. Um, come into play. Um, so it, it, you'll see this further down here. Is instance is a level, lovely Pythonism. You don't have that in in other languages, especially not in strongly typed or compiled languages. Um, so this has to go. And then you also see that we are currently using 500 a lot. And then we have like zero 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 for stuff that we uh, totally didn't expect. And then we have nine 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 for stuff that we even less expected than that. Um, this is this is in flux, but basically um, it's a callable. So Python gives you this function call, and because I'm still at this point in time, I was still when I was writing it, I was still assuming that maybe we have to do writes as well. I didn't know. Um, I actually checked that whether the operation is read, but I think all of this could be factored out so that only handle read. I wonder how long it takes James to tell me that I can pre just press the pound key to jump between searches. <coughs> I just remembered it. So this is, this is how a read is being handled. Um, there is a base class to this, um, which is called the base buffered FD reactor. And it does most of the ugly work for you. So all you do here is you basically shave data from the FD into a buffer that you don't even have to expose. Um, if, the c if you get it zero bytes off, that means that there was an EOF on the file descriptor. So uh, at this point in time, we do whatever we have to do in terms of cleaning up the reactor, 
and we also unregister from the core because we don't ever want to be called again with that file descriptor. That file descriptor is now invalid. And somehow that doesn't always work. That's why I have that temporary ugly stuff in the main loop. Um, this, is, this is stuff that simply uh, currently we, we would like to support on the control socket a protocol such as IMAP where you can have multiple commands going at the same time and then multiple results. So you prefix each command with a unique ID and you get results prefixed with that unique ID so that you can associate them. At the moment, we don't do that. At the moment, you can only do command, response, command, response, and therefore we check whether there is currently a dispatch in progress. And then if, if there is, then we just simply discard all the data of the control second at the moment. Um, just some checking, and then calls a dispatcher. And I'll show you the dispatch. So this is, this is pretty much what any reactor looks like. You know, it, it just checks the data for, for basic consistency. And then uh, if that passes, it does whatever it has to do with it. And in this case, it uses a dispatcher. The dispatcher is also callable. And I use something that is also very Pythonic here, but it could obviously be implemented with uh, either dynamic loading in C++ or, or um, in another way with a map of to callables or something like that. But I basically didn't want to have everything in here. So if we get a command, if we get, if we get called, the dispatcher gets called, it'll get called with a request object that basically uh, is just a struct with the stuff that we got. So peer is, is UID, GID, and so on and so forth. Also has the file descriptors that we need to write back on the socket. The command arguments is what follows the, the arguments. And then after the arguments, uh, it's HTTP-like. Um, after the first line, you have any number of parameter colon value pairs. And these are the parameters. So that's very simple. The request object contains them all. And then uses request.cmd to find out how to handle that command. So there are a couple of um, simple handlers down here. Um, these are handled, like ping, boing, hello, who am I, and so on and so forth, are handled directly in the control socket. And uh, everything else, if there is not such a function, then we actually currently try to load, dynamically load, a command handler for this. So netconf.commands is the namespace for that. In netconf.commands are classes that represent individual commands that can be issued. They are not control socket specific anymore, so these are um, also what netlink uses. And if we get a factory back, a command class, then, um, well, here you see the authorization that is happening. And we create an event based well, it's a command event. Uh, we are unsure how this is going to happen, right? St a string that just says capital command. Uh, I don't like it either, um, but we kind of like went that route right now. When, as a matter of fact, we could probably just get rid of this um, and make CMD be a child of an event class um, so that you can use polymorphism to determine what kind of event it is. But at the moment, this seemed simpler. Um, because Python doesn't actually do overloading properly. You do have to use this instance all the time, so that's why, why we use this more explicit approach. So we create the event that is basically the type, the payload, um, a pointer to the source, which is self. And because this is an init initial event, there is no parent. And we publish the event. So once the event gets published, um, it goes to this pub sub object, which is basically just associating um, events, event types with subscribers. So the control socket can say, I would like to subscribe to all result events or I would like to subscribe to all events that have this event as a parent. And then potentially later, we would like to be able to say st stuff like, I would like to be able to subscribe to all events relating to ETH0 or um, any, any other form of selection here. So th it's, very, it's a very simple publishing and subscription mechanism. Um, as you can see, very little code. 
And basically what it does is it takes the event and then when for each event, I think subscription entails a callback as well. So when there is an event received for each of the subscribers, we fire off the callback in series and pass it the event and then the subscribers can do whatever they want with it. So now we can get to the policy um, because the policy is our essential event handler. You can see here it's also callable, it gets an event, and now it's expected to do something with it. Um, and this is where it gets slightly ugly. Because this is completely work in progress. Let me just quickly find where the ugly part is. Oh man, we don't have it anymore. This, this is slightly ugly here, you know, like doing a switch on, on whether the parent is none or not. There might be a better way to do it but this is what we have right now. So if there, if there is a parent, um, then we obtain the command that actually led to this event. So if there is a parent, this is a result event, which is related to some sort of command event, and then we um, obtain the handler that was responsible for this event and also what the result was that we yielded. So um, in our earlier example, when we had ENI, DHCP, and link local, um, if ENI returns, I couldn't find an iFace stanza for this interface, then that will be a result event because it has a parent pointer. So CMD will become the original IF up command object. And I, I guess I didn't I didn't show you that, but it that's IF up is actually nothing. I think this is actually empty. Um, it just inherits from IF iFace command base. Um, which basically just checks whether they're, you know, like it does basic command checks. So the commands know what they expect, what sort of syntax there is, and that's it. Um, and store this, the data. So that ev everything that is related to the IF up is contained in this CMD object, which we get by traversing up the tree and obtaining the payload from the original command. Um, this, in, in our case of ENI, when the interface wasn't found, um, the ENI handler instance will be the source of this result event, and the result will be something like cannot handle or interface not found. If it's a command in and of itself, then we don't have to do all this traversing, and we don't have a handler, and we don't have a result. Um, this is the manipulator that is being created, which does the actual work on the interface later on. Neither of us likes the fact that we are creating it at this point, but we feel that this is a configuration thing, um, that you should be able to choose a different manipulator, for instance, one that only logs what it would be doing and doesn't actually do anything. That was the original idea I had because I, why I wanted to have manipulators. Um, but anyway, Manip is being uh, created here. And then, basically, we look, is there already a handler that tried what it was trying to do? If not, then we uh, obtain an initial handler and call it, and if there is was already a handler, then we use this information, the command, the handler, and the result to obtain the next one to try. And if we get a next one, then we call that one. Um, there's currently this go away stuff. Um, I, we don't like that either. So far, I haven't found a better way to do it. Um, go away is basically like after DHCP failed to get a lease and we want to go into power off, we really kind of want to be killing that DH client process as well. So after an event, uh, after a handler has notified policy and policy has said like, okay, nice try, now like go and sleep again, it needs to have a chance to react one more time because it has to be the policy that makes the decision whether the handler is done or not. We could also conceivably just leave DH client running, which is what's happening at the moment, and ignore the fact that it failed. Maybe that's a policy decision you'd like to take as an administrator. So you need, we need to go by the policy here. And that makes it kind of ugly. But uh, I haven't looked at this code in a long time. And I have to say my student did a lot of good work because I was very afraid of showing you the policy. And it looks a lot, lot better than I thought so. Anyway, there's another, a third type of event coming up here, which is a policy complete event. Um, as I said before, the event language is not complete yet. A policy complete event smells kind of fishy to me. 
but we needed this in order to be able to tell any subscribers that the policy is done with all of what it's trying to do. It has tried all the handlers, either one of them succeeded or none of them succeeded, now we're done. We can't deduce this information from the events that we get from the handlers. If ENI says I couldn't find any interface definition for this interface, then that doesn't mean anything to the source because maybe the policy is happy with that and just simply wants to try something else. Or maybe we're done at this point in time. So the policy actually has to also issue an event. And it makes sense. Uh, it's, it's really just the fact that I, I think I'm just not happy with the fact that we have capital letters here. <laughs> Um, so just quickly here, um, I showed this off yesterday as well. This is, uh, this is how we try to make the decisions here. Um, currently all hard-coded. I'm trying to think about a, a way to do the decisions in, uh, in a configuration file format. And the new PAM format is actually very nice. And PAM allows you to, for each thing to try or for each requisite or, or so on and so forth. It allows you to say what, what to do in the event of which result. So in, in terms of like, you can say, do something else. If the user is not found, then uh, do, do this if the authorization failed. So it is kind of like a three-dimensional thing that we're dealing with here, and the new PAM format does express that pretty nicely. But so far, we haven't settled. Well, my student actually misunderstood me on this, and he wrote the new PAM format parser. But uh, we're not using it at the moment. At the moment, we're hard coding this. And you can see that we simply have, this is all very ugly. Um, and this needs to be um, expressed in a class that can be handled much better because what we're basically doing is mapping a triplet to a callable, which is not necessarily, it doesn't allow me to do any wildcard matching and all that kind of stuff. I'd really like to be able to do that, obviously. You need to be able to say that I don't actually care about the source of the event, netlink, control socket, who cares, right? If DHCP fails, go to power off. So you need to be able to have that asterisk in there and it needs to be evaluated at point uh, at decision time and not like at parsing time so uh, but uh, that's as, as good as we have it right now um, but you you can see very very simple at the moment let's figure out what we need before anything else um, yeah so this this just does the the ugly parsing you can ignore that um, all right now let's have a look quickly at the picture and see where we are. So I've shown you the core. I've shown you the control socket a bit. I've shown you how it authorizes and dispatches events and how they arrive at the interface policy via the pub sub object um, and then get processed by the policy, which is actually just a subscriber. I don't actually know how we implemented it at this point, but I think policy is simply a subscriber to all events. Um, and so the event also arrives at the policy. And now here, the policy is um, responsible for finding out what to do and then delegating to a handler. And let's have a look at the DHCP handler. I, I promised I won't tell you about DH clients, but uh, let's have a look at the DHCP handler because I'm scared of ENI handler. But I'll show you that as well. Yes, 10 minutes. Oh, God. Um, so the handler gets a command in the manipulator and is basically responsible for doing whatever it should be doing. And in our case, it's very simple. Um, we either do IF up and we do IF down. So uh, we either spawn a DH client process or we kill it. Um, this DH client 3 proxy is actually how we interface with DH client, and all I want to show you is how it is actually a reactor in and of itself. So DH client will be publishing events on the file descriptor, and you can see here op, FD, and core again. Any reactor got called like this, and well, there's a there's a handle read here, and basically you can see how it tries it shaves off the environment, does DHCP stuff, and then delegates to one of the functions. It, if callable down there, they are called react2. And here you can see what happens. Like react2 pre init, for instance. We don't do medium and IP aliasing at the moment, but basically that just says manipulator, bring the interface up. 
or bound, which basically does look. Here we create a new address, an IP address object, manipulator, add that IP address to the interface, please. Now in all of these cases, if the IP address is already added to the interface, we still return success because we are actually declaring what we want and not being imperative about it. Routers and so on and so forth, and then there's expire and fail. Um, there's also a lot that's not implemented yet, like timeout. We haven't, we haven't, uh, just simply haven't implemented that yet, and that's largely because DH find is actually so broken that we can't test timeout properly. I'm not kidding. If you saw my last post uh, to to the planet, uh, DH client actually, uh, if you have two interfaces, one for testing, one for Wi-Fi, and there is a DHCP um, packet that arrives on the interface, it is undetermined which of the two DH client processes gets that packet. Not both of them. <laughs> Only one of them. So it makes it very, very difficult to do timeout testing. Um, all right. D that was DHCP. Let me do ENI handler. And I also have the FD proxy stuff. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's actually something I'll, I'll do at the very end, because maybe one of you guys has a good idea on how to handle it. I'm very frustrated with that stuff. Um, E and I used to be very uh, modular and nicely spread out and everything, and then I and we tried to be very smart about it. And I think it was on the flight to Argentina when I got thoroughly fed up and I deleted the entire like modularity and everything and implemented it all in one function. So it's a long function. Um, the reason why I did that is because we have something that I call a cooperative work queue runner. The work queue runner is basically something where you register events. Uh, sorry jobs, and then you call the work queue runner, and it calls the next job in the queue. And when the job is done, you mark it as done. That means it gets popped off the queue. And you call the work queue runner again, and the next job get, it gets executed. The reason why I did this, um, and that's in hindsight very stupid, because I wanted to make sure that when we actually IF up the interface, that we don't block the entire program while the IF up is executing we want to come back to the select loop so that you can press control C and kill that netconf process without having to wait until your DHCP, DH client decided after 60 seconds it can't get a lease. Um, so th that, that's a good approach, but I, tr I did it at a very, very granular level so that even hooks, even between hooks, we come back to the select loop, and that just made things very ugly. Um, but you'll see in a second. The reason so why I did this all in one function was simply because I hated passing arguments around at that point in time with all the callbacks and stuff. I was very annoyed. Um, w this is a very short line. We have other lines in there that have functions that take like 12 arguments and all this kind of stuff, and I really just don't like it. So what we do here is we create a cooperative work queue runner, and inform caller success is the last thing that gets called when the queue is empty. So if the queue is empty, then we simply raise an event that is a success result. Um, this handled event, the fact that it's called handled, and there's also a um, issue event function, that's one of those hackish things where we haven't found a clear way w in which you can channel both of these events through the same function. Uh, so that's a, that's a little hackish at this point. But um, So we create this work queue runner, and then we simply add jobs to it. And uh, if we do an IF up, then, oh yeah, here's the IF state file. Couldn't do without. IF up down ETC network interfaces doesn't allow you to do without because you don't know what hooks have been run or whether hooks have been run. You can't make it stateless. It doesn't work by design. Uh, I tried, but I gave up. Um, so then we de actually here we delegate to. Oh, let me let me see. Just make sure that I'm not losing it. We actually delegate to a method handler. So inet DHCP or inet six static. Those things are all handled outside. It's still modular in this sense. And then we populate the work queue runner. So first of all, we, have, we run the pre-up hooks. Hooks proxy simply uh, makes sure that the hooks get, and results from the hooks get uh, processed properly. So we add this job, and then we add the handler that we instantiated up here, which does the actual configuration. And then we add another job that does the st state file. And then we add a job that runs the post-up hooks. Very simple, right? Same thing for IF down. Won't go through that. And the last thing we do um, is call the work runner and let it do its job. So um, I think that is pretty much all I have to say to this. 
um, except for the fact, if you look at, for instance, handler proxy, um, it's this stuff that, that throws me off at times, right? So if we get, first of all, this is closure again, right? So we have to have a callback inside the function so that we actually have all the data available. Um, this could be done better, but it works for now. Um, we call the, the function, and we call it with a callback wait for handler, and so this function gets called as soon as the handler is done, and it gets the result. Um, if it's a success result, then we mark the job is done and add a timed callback, timeout zero, so immediately as soon as possible, um, to the core loop, and it'll get the, the work you run, it gets called again. Um, otherwise, we process the event. So let's have a quick look here at static, inet static, if up, we simply shave off all the data from the live face, the logical interface, um, which the parser returned us, and then set IP address, instead of add IP address, because we're actually doing what if up down does, uh, which overrides all your interfaces if you bring it up, uh, all your addresses, and so on. No rocket science here. So I think that's pretty much the, the whole picture and the code to it. And uh, um, the, the code is in flux, but we're, we're getting to a point where I can actually, like, I, I didn't think I was going to be able to get up here and explain this code. And I hope I managed to do it a little bit. Um, I hope you see that it, it, it still needs work, but uh, I hope you can make some more sense of it. Let me, f are there any questions? I'm happy, of course, after this to discuss more if anyone is interested. But uh, let me finish off then by showing you this file descriptor stuff. And uh, actually, in the root directory of the checkout, there's a doc subdirectory and a design document. And uh, so everything that I've told you now is essentially explained here. The main loop, events, the policy, what they do, um, event sources. Um, this is the point where I'm currently a little bit uh, helpless, I shall say. Uh, part of the helplessness is when, remember those command ob objects, the command that um, has all the data that relates to an if up command, which gets authorized and passed to the uh, policy and then causes a handle to, to be spawned. One of the attributes of this object is the source of where it came from. And some of the, so, so we have something that is um, command source. Um, and basically every single, like the control socket is a command source and netlink is a command source. And look at this stuff. Um, we, we, I made this a proxy where you can register what I call output readers and output reactors. So the difference is simply the output reactor um, gets a file descriptor and reads the data off. The output reader writes directly to the uh, target file descriptor. Um, if I look at the control socket reactors constructor, you will see that what we're doing here is we're adding to our command source base class an output named output reader for standard out, which is a callback here. Forward to standard out, so whenever there is data that is written to the output reader by the name of standard out, we actually end up calling this function um, forward standard out, which prefixes the data with an O or an E, because we only have one disc um, channel for the control socket. Um, so one of the problems why I don't like this is because we are sometimes passing around the entire command object, when as a matter of fact, we only actually needed the source, the command source object. So that's not that, that's, that's something that's easily fixed. We just haven't done it yet. On the other hand, it, it feels like um, I'm not entirely sure that whether this is the, the right way to do it. If you spawn a DH client, you need to give it a standard out or something, um, file descriptor, so it can dump all the debug info that we've come to love so much. Um, if you disconnect, so that that's, Initially, um, I, about a year ago, when I started, there was simply a file descriptor to the socket being passed around, and you would just simply link that file descriptor up and just dump everything on there.
but now if the control socket disconnects, you couldn't reattach to the running DH client. So this is why I wanted to have that proxy in there, so that now if the control socket reconnects, assuming that you can, you know, there's no authentication going on, like everybody can see everyone's DHCP output, basically, um, now you can, you can shift those functions around and you can redirect at this level because the actual uh, reading, the actual reacting is still happening in the same file descriptor proxy. Um, I, I'm unhappy with it, even though it feels like there's no other way to do it, but maybe some of you guys know a better way or when you look at it, you come up with some better way to do it. Maybe you can also, you know, maybe you'll just take the clue bat and say like you're trying to solve problems that are non-existent. Um, so far, I'm, I would prefer to support um, this sort of reconnecting and making sure that uh, we, we don't end up with data on file descriptors that is not being read. Because on, on the other hand, um, as soon as you have, you need to, with this model, with a select loop, you need to always read your data off the file descriptors because um, I'm almost done. Um, you always need to read the data of the file descriptors, otherwise your file descriptors do not get closed. The kernel will actually keep the file descriptor open, and that means that you cannot actually remove sub -pro you can't read your sub-processes, and that means you get zombie entries in your process table all over the place. So that, uh, this, is, this is one of the points where I was, you know, I said yesterday a couple of times I'm not a Unix systems programmer, and that can't make me realize this even more. But uh, I realized when I was doing this that I actually think Unix is not always the best thing. <laughs> this file descriptor stuff and reaping children and all this, it's very, very annoying. Reaping children is another topic in there. There's a, there's a function that in the core that allows you to register child reapers. So whenever you get a sick child, all of them are called. There's no other way for you to actually properly finish a subprocess than going via signals, which is kind of annoying. But anyway, um, I hope this wasn't too short, and I hope this wasn't too confusing. Um, I would love to have questions now or on the mailing list or at any point in time. And uh, of course, I'd like to see all of you more on the mailing list and everywhere getting involved in this. Um, I'm totally happy to uh, answer any form of questions, and it's not, I'd like to uh, make sure that, and my student needs to hear that as well, I'd like to make sure that I everyone knows that I don't take any claim to know what is the right thing to do with things like that. I just kind of move forward, but I'm very happy if any one of you says hey, that's complete bonkers, tell me. I'm very, very interested in hearing that. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>